Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have this special presentation. It's being held as part of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial's VJ Day, Victory Over Japan, 75th Anniversary Commemoration. I'm Holly Rotundi. I'm the director of the Friends of the National World War II Memorial. And on behalf of our entire board and staff, again, thanks for joining us. We, uh, we have been engaged in a full four-year 75th anniversary commemoration, and this is the culmination uh, today and our events on Wednesday, and we hope you'll join us online for our day-long commemorative events on Wednesday. Um, but we're the only organization who's hosted a full four-year 75th anniversary commemoration marking every major battle in which American troops took part. So it's been a very busy but rewarding four years. And I hope you've been able to take part in some of those uh, special commemorations. Anyway, we're here today, uh, I'm privileged to have with us uh, military historian Richard Frank. He is an internationally recognized leading authority on the Asia Pacific War. He published his first book, Guadalcanal, back in 1990. And just recently in March 2020, his book, The Tower of Skulls, um, was, came out. And it's the first volume of his trilogy on the Asia Pacific War. Uh, from 1937 to 1945. So without uh, further ado, I, I just did want to mention, uh, if you have any questions while um, Mr. Frank is giving his presentation, you can write them in the comments. And our public education officer, Thalia Ertman, will be moderating the Q&A uh, at the end of uh, Mr. Frank's presentation. So without further ado, Mr. Frank, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Holly. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear uh, for the World War II Memorial. What I want to talk about today is the end that we're commemorating some 75 years ago, of what I believe we should call and understand as the Asia Pacific War, not just the Pacific War. And this is not simply a difference in word choice. It is a very fundamental conceptual difference in how we look at these events. And the key guides to doing this are to count all the dead, to treat all the dead as sharing a common humanity and I pretty much include the Japanese in that uh, category. Now, the Asia Pacific War began in July 1937 when the Chinese began mounting sustained resistance to Japanese aggression. That war would continue on for eight years and one month, ending in August 1945. It was a war of immense span, which we now seldom recognize. Although it began in China, it exploded west to India, south to what's now Indonesia, east to the Hawaiian Islands, north to the Aleutian Islands and the northeast corner of Asia. That uh, area I call the Ark of Asia, and in 1937, it contained over a billion people, which was more than half the total population of the globe. When Japan's imperial reach reached its zenith in uh, May of 1942, there were no fewer than 516 million people within Japan's control. That was a little over 20% of the total world population. When Hitler's uh, reach was at his maximum, he had about 360 million people under his heel, and that's about 14% of the world population. Now, more than midway through the uh, Asia Pacific War, Japan attacked the US and its allies in December 1941. We've called that the Pacific War, but really it was only a subpart of the larger Asia Pacific War. And the difference between the two can be expressed simply in two words, the dead. If you use just a conservative accounting, the Asia Pacific War resulted in the deaths of about 25 million human beings. Of that number, about 6 million were combatants, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and about five of six were either Chinese or Japanese. Well, that immediately tells you that there were 19 million non-combatant deaths. Well, how, how many of those were Japanese? Well, using a generous accounting, you can get Japanese non-combatant deaths to somewhere between a million and maybe 1.2 million, but no more. That math immediately tells you that for every Japanese non-combatant who perished, some 17 or 18 other non-combatants died. 12 of them were Chinese, or 12 million. These were overwhelmingly people who were not Japanese. They were other Asians. And they are suffering by far the greatest loss in the Asia Pacific War. Now, by contrast, the Pacific War, the war essentially between the U.S. and Japan, between uh, across the Pacific, resulted in the deaths of, at, at the most, three to three and a half million people, which is something like 12 to 15 percent of the total deaths 
in the Asia Pacific War. And if you consider this is only the Pacific War, you perversely exclude from your consideration almost all of those 17 or 18 million deaths who were not Japanese, and also make it seem as though the great majority of the non-combatant deaths were Japanese. By the summer of 1945, most of those 17 or 18 million non-combatants who died who were not Japanese were already dead, and they were dying at a rate of, depending on your projection, between eight and maybe 14,000 per day, every single day, or 240 to 400,000 per month. Uh, that's the reality of, of this. It's now clearly one of the greatest and epic tragedies in human histories, and most of those who were dying were not Japanese. Now, when we get to an accounting for what happened 75 years ago, the first thing we need to understand is some important context. But first of all, the decision of when and how the war would end actually rested in Japan, not in Washington. When we get to the look at the Japanese political and military decision-making process, however, it was astonishingly dysfunctional. I can't begin to go into all the details of that, but one facet of it is absolutely crucial to what we're talking about today. The legal government of Japan from April 1945 to the end of the war was under a prime minister, uh, Admiral Kentaro Suzuki. The actual power within that government to make a decision rested in an inner cabinet called uh, the Big Six. Uh, the Big Six could only act by complete unanimity, a 6-0 vote. And of the membership of the Big Six, three were admirals, two were generals, and just one, the foreign minister, was a civilian. So you can see what a stranglehold the military had over Japan's path in 1945. Now, when we get to specifically what the Japanese were doing in 1945, well, the first thing you have to note is that uh, as, as of July 1944, at the top echelons of the Japanese military, it was recognized and written down that uh, Japan was defeated. But here we were almost a year later, and more Americans have died in that that last year of the war, then it died in the two years and eight months prior to that point. And the war continued because defeat is not the same as surrender. And when the Japanese surveyed the situation in January 1945, they recognized that their military situation was indeed a disastrous, but the warrior sensibilities of Japan's effective rulers absolutely rebelled at the notion of any type of surrender. And moreover, they thought they saw a path forward to an end of the war that they could abide. And they called this strategy Ketsugo, or Operation Decisive. It was a two-step sequential military and then political and diplomatic strategy. I cannot emphasize enough that the foundation of it was the notion that Japan had to change the military balance. So the Japanese leaders, particularly this inner cabinet, the Big Six, saw no need to work out any systematic effort at determining conditions to end the war, or the a, the standards on which they intended to end the war until the counter-invasion battle. And when they got down to the specifics, their reasoning went like this, that although the United States had much greater material power, they believed American morale was brittle and could be broken. And they sought to do that by waiting for what they expected to be the American invasion or initial American invasion of the Japanese home islands. And their plan was to defeat or inflict such enormous casualties on that initial invasion that the U.S. will continue the war to unconditional surrender will be broken and they could achieve a negotiated peace to their taste. And when we get to their actual planning for this great battle, they were chillingly prescient about what was going to happen. They recognized that the standard American operational approach on major operations was to not launch them unless it was within range of land-based American fighter aircraft. And in January 1945, they expected the U.S. to hold Okinawa by mid-year. And land-based fighter aircraft from Okinawa would range over southern Kyushu. And they further knew that the Americans would be coming primarily for air base sites to support further operations. And they looked at a topographical map of southern Kyushu, and it told them exactly where the landing beaches that the U.S. would employ would be targeted by the American invasion. And then they mounted an enormous buildup of forces on southern Kyushu to meet that expected invasion. And the benchmarks for this are basically like this. At the very beginning of the year of 1945, there was only one Japanese field division, probably 15 to 20,000 men at most, on the entire island of Kyushu. Uh, 
and there were several hundred aircraft based at various air bases on the island. By August 1945, there were 14 Japanese divisions, 10 large brigades, an assortment of other units that brought the total Japanese strength on Kyushu to between 700,000 and 900,000 men. And the Japanese sat there very confident that with this force, they would be able to either defeat or inflict such loss on that initial invasion that they could obtain and negotiate it into the war. Now, there's one other fi figure that we need to talk about right now, and that is Emperor Hirohito, the Emperor of Japan. The six men who controlled Japan's destiny within the legal government uh, also were joined by one additional figure, the Emperor, making seven men who truly controlled Japan's destiny. But when we look at what Emperor Hirohito stood for in 1945, we find that formally he was both a god and the supreme ruler of Japan. But in fact, he had been carefully insulated from active participation in the management of Japan's forces, manage, management of Japan's government and war strategy to preserve the sense of his infallibility. He had only intervened on one occasion since he became emperor in 1925 to directly guide Japan. And that was in 1936, when a military coup was attempted in Tokyo, literally right beneath his nose, and that mobilized him to act. Other than that, he had never been mobilized to act decisively to guide Japan. Now, the Big Six had mounted a uh, rather pathetic effort to open a negotiation channel with the Soviet Union in May 1945. But they only sought to keep the Soviet Union out of the war, for the Soviets were not yet in the Asia Pacific War, and further, perhaps even to induce the Soviets to become an ally of Japan. Well, that proposal got nowhere. And in June 1945, when there was a formal meeting, what's called an imperial conference in Japan, to discuss what to do, that conference had, had sanctioned that Japan would fight on without any consideration for surrender. And after that, the emperor's principal advisor, a fellow named Lord Kido, sent the emperor a memo explaining that the emperor needed to get involved on the diplomatic side and seek uh, to use the Soviet Union to act as a mediator to negotiate an end of the war. This was not to simply deliver a surrender note, but to secure Soviet um, a middleman as a mediator to negotiate into the war. And what's instructive is that when Quito prepared this proposal, he also sketched out terms to end the war. And what Quito sketched out was a effectively a repraise of the Treaty of Versailles. Japan might have to give up some overseas territories. It might have to endure a period of disarmament, but there would be no occupation of Japan the old order in Japan would be preserved, including Emperor Hirohito's seat on the throne. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about whether certain terms could have been offered the Japanese that could have obtained their surrender before the end of the war. We come back, though, to this very fundamental point. None of the members of the Big Six ever set forth, either before Hiroshima or afterwards, a set of terms on which they had been prepared to end the war prior to Hiroshima. Moreover, the emperor himself never claimed either before or after that there was any set of conditions, including the one frequently mentioned, that if we just promised to keep him on the throne, he would have ordered the government to surrender. Well, the emperor never endorsed that view whatsoever. And it's very instructive that in early 1946, he prepared a lengthy statement about his uh, conduct and positions throughout the war, which provided an ideal opportunity for the emperor to claim there was some sort of set of conditions that might have mobilized him to act sooner than he actually did to end the war, including simply a, pr a promise to preserve his seat on the throne. And the emperor never claimed that. So all the argument about what these men should have done or would have done basically founders in the fact that they never claimed they would have complied with these various theories about how the war might have ended early. So what was the United States seeking in 1945? Well, President Franklin Roosevelt in January 1943, had set forth the national war aim as the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers. Now, for our purposes, the important point about unconditional surrender by 1945 was this. The, the individuals who were planning the occupation and the reforms of Japan and Germany based their very ambitious goals on the fact that under in unconditional surrender, the U.S. would have the right to do things it could not do under the ordinary international law of military occupation. In other words, unconditional surrender was not simply some sort of slogan for victory. It was absolutely foundational to securing an enduring peace. The task of devising a military strategy to secure 
conditional surrender, however, fell to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they divided sharply over the issue of time versus casualties. The Army, led by General George C. Marshall, believed that the uh, essential element to maintain American, the American people's support for the war was time. And the Army further posited that, basically, the fastest way to end the war was to invade the Japanese home islands. The Navy, led by Admiral Ernest J. King, however, had literally studied war with Japan for about four decades. And from that very intense and lengthy study, the Navy had devised one fundamental principle, and that was any invasion of the Japanese home islands would produce politically unacceptable casualties. And therefore, the Navy rejected any strategy of invasion out of hand. The Navy's alternative strategy, however, was a combination of air and sea bombardment and blockade. Now, this is really important, and this is a point that is missed in almost all the discussions about this. What the Navy was looking at with blockade was to force the surrender of the Japanese government by starving to death millions of Japanese, mostly non-combatants. That's what blockade was all about. In 1945, the weapons that were then available could produce uh, deaths numbered in thousands but they could not kill millions. Even atomic bombs at that time were puny compared to what came later and did not have that sort of capacity. And moreover, you have to remember that blockade would be a strategy that would take at least months. And in addition to all the Japanese non-combatants who were going to perish, remember that non-Japanese non-combatants were dying at the rate of between 240 and 400,000 per month. So the combination of Japanese and other non-combatants who were going to die under blockade was stupendous. I would argue that this was the most ruthless strategy the U.S. were prepared to use to end the war with Japan. And this takes us to a further point. Repeatedly in the controversies over the end of the war, the arguments are raised about alternatives to the use of atomic bombs. What characterizes these arguments, however, is basically they will tell you that there is an alternative they will not sketch out in detail what the alternative meant. And the issue of the blockade of Japan is a perfect example of that. There were admirals, you can find them quoted in some of the literature, saying that, well, we could have ended the war without atomic bombs. Well, what they're talking about is the campaign of blockade, but you're not told what blockade was really about or what the likely numbers of deaths resulting from blockade uh, that blockade would have produced. Would have Hence, it's easy for you to assume that the bombs were, in fact, uh, morally, uh, uh, morally more troublesome than the blockade. Now, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in April 1945 adopted a policy paper setting forth the strategy going forward and the reasoning behind it. And in that policy paper, they indicated that the campaign of blockade and bombardment, which had begun, which was still growing in intensity, will continue until November 1945, uh, uh, at which point it would be joined by Operation Downfall, a two-phase invasion of the Japanese home islands. The first phase, Operation Olympic, would target southern Kyushu, in other words, exactly where the Japanese expected us to come. The target date for that was the 1st of November, and that would secure air bases that would support a second phase, Operation Coronet, generally set for March 1st, 1946, would be a landing in the Tokyo area. But the Joint Chiefs pointed out that there were two very fundamental problems they had in trying to devise a strategy that would secure Japan's unconditional surrender. The first of these, the Joint Chiefs noted, was that no Japanese government had ever surrendered in Japan's entire history. Now, by Japanese count, that was no fewer than 2,600 years. And the second thing the Joint Chiefs noted was that no Japanese unit had ever surrendered in the skirmish battle or campaign of the entirety of the Asia-Pacific War. And what the Joint Chiefs are really getting at here is that the real American nightmare in 1945 was not the, quote, invasion of Japan, unquote. It was the prospect that we could not obtain an organized capitulation of Japan's government and Japan's armed forces. We would then be left with the prospect, as they then calculated it, of defeating some 5 million Japanese under arms in the home islands on the Asian continent and across the Pacific with such help as our allies might be able to provide for a time period that was entirely unpredictable. Now, let's focus in more closely about the last months of the war. The campaign on Iwo Jima ended on March 16, 1945. 
This was the first campaign in the entire Pacific War in which total American casualties in dead and wounded exceeded Japanese casualties. Some 7,000 or almost 7,000 Americans had died uh, taking Iwo Jima. On the 1st of April, the U.S. landed on Okinawa, as the Japanese expected. And then on the 12th of April, President Franklin Roosevelt died, and Harry S. Truman became president. President Truman immediately announced that his policy was to attempt to execute as best he could the legacies of President Franklin Roosevelt. What President Truman would find out very shortly was that it was one thing to announce that that was his policy. It was another thing to find out what President Roosevelt's legacies had been, because President Roosevelt had played his cards, as we would say, very close to the vest. And many of his advisors, even close advisors, were not certain about what his actual policies were on various issues. But there was one major exception to this. And that was the fact that Franklin Roosevelt had authorized and initiated the program to build the atomic bombs, the Manhattan Project. And Mr. Truman had never received any word from any advisor that had been with FDR or otherwise that Mr. Roosevelt would not have used the bombs when they became available. Now, in addition to facing uh, the problems of divining what the policies of Franklin Roosevelt were, President Truman immediately began taking in daily briefings on what was going on on Okinawa. And these showed that the campaign was bogging down and American casualties were growing and growing and growing. One of Mr. Truman's uh, officers uh, commented that Mr. Truman was, as he put it, perturbed about casualties on Okinawa. And in fact, Mr. Truman called a meeting in the White House on June 18th to examine the proposed invasion of Japan. And Mr. Truman indicated that his principal criterion for deciding uh, about the invasion would be casualties. Well, at that meeting, Mr. Truman also said that he was fearful that we would be encountering in Okinawa from one end of Japan to the other. But, the, but in the end, he reluctantly gave his sanction for Operation Olympic, but he would not even give tentative sanction for Operation Cornet, that second phase of the invasion. And essentially what happened at that meeting was that President Truman was facing all of his senior advisors and every one of them advised him that he should authorize the Olympic. And secondly, he was presented with a briefing that showed at that time, we believed we'd be attacking uh, Southern Kyushu with overwhelming superiority on land, air, and sea. Now, as the summer went on, however, the picture radically changed. And I can summarize, uh, oh, let, me, let me go back for one thing. Uh, in the meantime, we were intercepting Japanese diplomatic communications uh, due to our massive penetration, both Japanese diplomatic and military uh, communications. And what these showed was that there were a number of Japanese uh, military attaches or diplomatic uh, officials in Western Europe who presented themselves as what I would call peace entrepreneurs, who were presenting themselves as though they represented the Japanese government and prepared to negotiate an end of the war. And much has been made of this. If you actually read the intercepts, the daily intercept summaries that were being sent to Mr. Truman and his principal advisors, you will see that the intercepts had clearly demonstrated that none of these individuals actually carried the sanction of the Japanese government. And more importantly, Mr. Truman and his principal advisors knew that there was no significance to these peace entrepreneurs over in Europe. The only effort that the Japanese had launched outside of Japan where they actually had sanctioned the effort was through the Japanese ambassador in Moscow, a gentleman named Naotaki Sato. And this was an attempt to enlist the Soviet Union uh, to act as a mediator to negotiate an end of the war. Now, there were two essential steps that Japan had to take to make this, this uh, effort effective. First of all, they had to provide the Soviets with inducements to have them become a mediator. And secondly, they need to provide the Soviets with terms for ending the war. And Sato emphasized both of those points. His cables, when you stack them up, end to end with, in his exchanges with the Japanese foreign minister, a gentleman named uh, Siginori Togo in Tokyo, uh, read like what I would call a, a searing cross-examination by a prosecuting attorney on behalf of the Truman administration. Sato is scathing about the pathos and ineffectiveness okay. of, the, uh, of the Japanese effort uh, to secure the Soviets as mediators. At one point, when uh, Togo attempts to give him some phrases to use to induce the Soviets to be mediators, Sato replies with a, with a comment that says, quote, these are pretty little phrases devoid of all connection with reality, unquote. 
And that's the tenure of much of what Sato says in his exchanges with Togo. Togo, uh, Sato emphasizes that if the effort is real and they really want to get the Soviets involved, Japan is going to have to specify terms to end the war. But of course, Togo can't provide terms because the big six has never provided or never decided upon terms to end the war. And finally, in absolute exasperation, Sato says, well, the best that Japan can hope for now is unconditional surrender, modified only to the extent that the imperial institution will be preserved. Well, the editors of that daily uh, diplomatic summary that's going to Mr. Truman and other senior officials immediately recognize that this is an extremely significant message. And then they get Togo's reply. And Togo absolutely rejects the proposal by Sato as to conditions to end the war. There's not even a hint in, in Togo's message that say, I mean, to say that a, a, a promise to preserve the imperial institution would be a step in the right direction. In fact, you can search all of uh, Togo's cables and there's no indication whatsoever that there are any conditions for ending the war in July, 1945 that the Japanese government would have accepted. And this information is then presented directly to Mr. Truman and his senior advisors. On top of this, something much worse is showing up in the intercepts. On the military side, the picture being presented is of this enormous Japanese buildup on Southern Kyushu. Now here we have a, a slide of Operation Olympic. And on the left, you'll see what we thought we were getting when we planned and authorized the operation in June. You see, we would have overwhelming superiority going into Southern Kyushu. And on the right, you see the situation by August, 1945, with this enormous Japanese buildup. And even this doesn't do justice to the numerical factors here. We had about 380,000 assault troops, the ones who would actually be doing the fighting, going to Southern Kyushu. The Japanese were going to have between 700,000 and 900,000 men to meet them. This was a sure prescription for a bloodbath. And on the 27th of July, 1945, the magic diplomatic summary, which was sent daily to Mr. Truman, included an annex with an appraisal of what all the intercepts, both military and diplomatic, had shown up to that point. And not as, as if this was not already clear to anyone who actually was diligently reading those summaries, which of course Mr. Truman had been. And basically the analysis said, there's no indication the Japanese are anywhere close to surrender. The militarists in Japan are firmly in control. And on top of that, it's clear that Operation Olympic now is heading for this enormous and unbelievable bloodletting. And that's why Mr. Truman authorizes the use of atomic weapons. So now how does the war actually end? Well, on the 6th of August, 1945, the V-29 Nolige drops an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. The Japanese learned that something horrific has happened to Hiroshima, and then they monitor a broadcast from Mr. Truman saying that it was an atomic bomb. Now their reaction to this is extremely significant. And it gets to an issue that's been bandied about, about whether a demonstration of a bomb would have been possible rather than dropping one initially on a city. And the sad fact is, for the reasons I'll explain, that no possible demonstration of that nature could have worked. And here's why. The Japanese had an atomic bomb program. It didn't give them an atomic bomb, but it give, did give an education up to the top echelons of the Japanese leadership that producing fissionable material was a stupendously difficult task. And it takes fissionable material to make an atomic bomb an atomic bomb. So when the word reaches the Japanese leadership that the Americans are claiming that Hiroshima had been hit by an atomic bomb, the reaction of the Imperial Army is that they won't concede that the U.S. has even one atomic bomb until there's an investigation. The Imperial Navy's reaction is far more ominous. Their stance is, well, maybe the Americans do have one atomic bomb, but they can't have that many of them, and they won't be that powerful. So what this gets to is that the leadership of Japan was not going to be dissuaded by a demonstration of one bomb or any conceivable one bomb demonstration. What would convince them that the U.S. had nuclear weapons that were an important factor would be a demonstration by the U.S. that the U.S. had an arsenal of powerful atomic bombs. And that's why the Nagasaki bomb proved to be so important because it created what effectively was actually a bluff in August 1945. We had immediately at hand an arsenal of powerful nuclear weapons. And what's instructive in this respect is that uh, General Anami, the war minister who, next to the emperor, was the most powerful figure in Japan in 1945, he had been adamant that the war must continue after Hiroshima. After Nagasaki, he starts telling other members of the leadership that the Americans have 100 atomic bombs and the next target may be Tokyo. <laughs> 
The Soviet Union will enter the war during the night of August 8th and 9th, 1945 in Manchuria. And this is another topic of controversy. Is it Soviet intervention that actually causes the Japanese to surrender and not the atomic bombs? Well, the reality is that Soviet intervention comes very close to scuttling any prospect of peace and then will eventually play an important role in another aspect of securing the surrender. And that is that we need to have some legitimate authority in Japan who decides the country will surrender, and then Japan's armed forces must comply with that surrender. Now, when the word reaches Tokyo of the Soviet intervention on the morning of August 9th, a general named Toroshio Kawabe, who's effectively the number two officer on the operational side of the Imperial Army, and is keeping a daily diary. And he writes in that diary that he's shocked that the Soviets have intervened at that point, but he immediately drafts up a plan to deal with the situation. And that plan is to declare martial law throughout Japan, and if necessary, to abolish any last vestige of any civilian government and rule the nation directly from imperial headquarters so there can be no prospect of surrender. And he shows that to the war minister, General Anami. And Anami is satisfied with it and says he'll take that forward as the policy of the general staff. So you have a reaction by two of the top three officers in the Imperial Army at the beginning of the morning of August 9th that basically would follow a policy that would prevent any possibility of any surrender. Now, the other aspect about Soviet intervention that doesn't get mentioned as it should is this. According to historian John Dower, when the Soviets intervene in the war, they capture or take into custody between 1.6 and 1.7 million Japanese nationals in Manchuria and in Northeast Asia. When the repatriation process of these individuals is completed after the end of the war, the Japanese count only 1.2 million uh, individuals who've been returned. So in other words, between 400,000 and 500,000 Japanese are either dead or missing in Soviet captivity as a result of Soviet intervention. And we have Soviet archival documents indicating that about 61,000 of those people who are dead or missing are military personnel. And the math tells you that this means that somewhere just under 340,000 to 440,000 Japanese non-combatants died in Soviet captivity after Soviet intervention. Now, the usual figure uh, that I use and John Dower uses, the number of Japanese who died in the atomic attacks, both immediately and lately, is like 210,000 or so. So in other words, Soviet intervention killed more Japanese non-combatants than the atomic bombs. Now, the other thing that happens at this juncture is that the emperor has decided to intervene. And he did so on the afternoon of August 8th, which is before Soviet intervention. And he tells the foreign minister, uh, Togo, that the war must end now. And on the night of August 9th and 10th, he has a meeting with the, the government at an imperial conference. And this is where the emperor will effectively order the government to surrender in this major intervention so unprecedented in his rule, in his rule, or nearly unprecedented in his rule. Now, before he does so, however, the number one guy on the operational side of the Imperial Army, a general named Umizo, tells the emperor that Soviet intervention, as he puts it, is unfavorable, but it does not negate Ketsugo. What Umizo is getting at is this. The Soviets had tremendous conventional uh, ground power and tactical air power on the Asian continent, but they had extremely limited sea lift capacity and did not have the ability to transfer, transfer to the Japanese home islands this highly mechanized, highly armored, and heavily equipped with artillery army that they use on the Asian continent. That's why Umizu says that Ketsugo is still a viable, oper, oper, uh, a viable operation, even after Soviet intervention. Now, the emperor has uh, given his uh, directive to the government. The government agrees to comply. But almost immediately, what happens is this. This uh, General Kawabe that I talked about before in keeping his diary, he uh, notes that after he learns that the emperor has intervened to order the government to surrender, one of the other senior officers in imperial headquarters comes to him and says that he doesn't think the overseas commanders are going to comply. Well, uh, those overseas commanders, two of the three immediately announced they're not going to comply with the surrender. And the emperor eventually has to issue a proclamation, both to the Japanese people announcing the surrender, but also a separate one to seek compliance of his, uh, his individual uh, overseas commanders with the surrender order. And that, sending, and that and sending imperial princes there will eventually secure compliance with the Japanese armed forces to his surrender order. So if you put all these things together, it comes back to my basic point, that this was an epic tragedy. 
And the pathway that we got to this was really a miraculous deliverance that could have gone wrong at any number of points, but fortunately didn't. Now, let me shift to one other thing that we're now coming up on, the 75th anniversary. It's a wonderful story about Mr. Truman and America. Immediately after the occupation of Japan began, Japanese authorities began presenting to the American occupation leaders uh, an, an argument that Japan was facing a disastrous food crisis for 1946, that there simply would not be enough food to feed the Japanese people. One of the Japanese cabinet officers uh, early in the fall of 1945 says that 10 million Japanese will starve to death in the coming year. Well, what's happened is the Japanese rice crop for 1945 has collapsed from what had been an average of about 10 million metric tons to a little over 6 million metric tons. And anyone who simply does the math and figures that that rice crop had to carry the Japanese people through to the rice crop, which would be harvested in September and October 1946, simply was not going to be large enough to feed all the Japanese people. And by the summer of 1946, there would be an extremely severe food crisis, famine conditions, probably affecting the urban areas. Well, the American occupation authorities initially were somewhat skeptical about the Japanese presentations, but by the end of 1945, American officials had come to two conclusions. The first of which was the Japanese were correct, that there was going to be mass starvation in Japan in 1946. And secondly, that the only way to head off mass starvation of Japanese in 1946 would be to ship large quantities of American food to Japan. Now you can imagine the context of this. We've just finished an extremely bitter war with the Japanese, and now we're being uh, asked to send a lot of food to our erstwhile bitter enemy. Well, in General Douglas MacArthur's checkered career, this was, in my view, his finest moment, because MacArthur gets four square behind the idea that we have to ship American food to Japan to save the Japanese from famine. And initially, his representations to Washington are rebuffed. But this being Douglas MacArthur, he will not take no for an answer. He even has the effrontery to say that his cables urging that this be done be shown to Mr. Truman so there can be no question about the chain of responsibility, as MacArthur puts it. And Mr. Truman, to be honest, was reluctant at first about this, but eventually he comes around and authorizes the shipment. And the upshot of all of this is that in July 1946, American food is feeding 18 million Japanese uh, uh, urban dwellers. In August, it's 20 million. And in September, it's 15 million. This is between one in four and one in five of all the Japanese population at that time. It includes the entirety of the population of Tokyo in July and August, which is about 2.5 million people. Afterwards, the occupation authorities calculate that this food saved 11 million Japanese lives. Now, the total number of Japanese who died in the eight years of the Asian Pacific War is somewhere between three to maybe 3.2 million. So American food in 1946 saved the lives of almost four times as many Japanese as died in the entirety of the Asia Pacific War. Now this talk has focused mainly about death, but when we remember the American actions that headed off a famine in Japan in 1946, we conclude, we conclude this now on a note about life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that great presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed it. We want um, now to have you guys engage in some question and answers. Uh, Mr. Frank is ready to take your questions. I know I saw some in the comment box. There's also a button um, where you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question live. Uh, and Thalia, our public education officer, is going to be um, moderating the Q&A for us. So we thank her. But I do want to acknowledge a couple of people who are on, a couple of very special people. Uh, Mr. Ira Rigger, who served with the Navy Seabees uh, in World War II in the Pacific Theater, uh, is on with us today. So thank you and welcome, Mr. Rigger. And also Colonel Cohn, who uh, served the Army in the European Theater and served in the Battle of the Bulge. So Thanks to both of those gentlemen for joining us today. And I'll, I'll send it over to Thalia now to, help, to start moderating the Q&A. Thanks, Holly. All right, Mr. Frank, are you ready for some questions? Yes, indeed. <laughs> 
Yeah, and like Holly said, if anybody wants to ask a question in person, they're more than welcome to use the raise hand feature or message me um, on the chat and, um, and then I can call on you also. But I'll read the ones that are in the chat box right now um, and then we'll move on from there. So, um, all right, the first question I see is from Marsha Waldstreicher and she asks, were the Chinese non-combatant statistics divided into not fighting against Japan or fighting in the civil war occurring? No, the statistics, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what I stood by there is, is uh, what now I think is the standard one volume history of China in World War II by Professor Ron Emitter of Oxford uh, called Forgotten Allies. It's a wonderful book. And uh, how many people died in China, of course, has been very difficult to deal with because of the circumstances of the war, the confusion, and the various authorities who either and did not keep or did not want to keep records. And Rana said that the reasonable range for Japanese deaths, uh, for Chinese deaths in the Asia Pacific War, this is, this is the 37 to 45 period, is between 12, uh, between 14 and 20 million. And he put the 14 million figure as 12 million non-combatants and 2 million uh, military deaths. Uh, I slightly increased the military deaths in my view, based on what I've looked at. I just think more Chinese soldiers died than in two million. I stick with Rana's low end figure. That that's not a feature. What I when you're dealing with this and you, you're dealing with these enormous numbers, and I always extremely cautious and particularly try to go to the low end numbers, particularly when the low end numbers are horrendous enough as it is, without getting into arguments over whether we're looking at 20 million or more. And you can certainly find published accounts saying the number of Jap Chinese who died during the war was 20 million or more. I mean, it, it, the numbers in just are totally, uh, almost unthinkable. Thank you. Yeah, then, yeah, that's, that's absurd to think about. Um, all right, from Mark Kelso, there's a question. Um, there were several POW camps on Kyushu as part of the Fukuoka POW camp group. Was there a plan for these POWs in the event that Operation Downfall took place? Um, you know, I don't know of any specific plans with respect to uh, targeting uh, the POW camps themselves. Uh, it had been a feature of General MacArthur's operations in the Philippines. He launched a number of special operations to liberate prison camps where he knew they existed. I know that uh, Admiral Nimitz, there had been a change in the, in the cities that were targeted, and uh, basically Kyoto was dropped and Nagasaki was added. And uh, Admiral uh, Nimitz was unhappy because he knew there were POWs that were being held in, the, in this, around the city of Nagasaki. And he did not want Nagasaki targeted, but the decision was made that Nagasaki would be included in the target group. I can also say this. One of the things I found in going through the documents was that General Marshall was extremely keen on the issue of getting the relief as fast as possible to POWs. And in that interval between the first Japanese uh, peace offer on the 10th of August, whatever, the first thing that uh, Marshall proposed was that the Japanese have to immediately turn over all the American and other uh, allied POWs and, and civilian internees into uh, allied custody before anything went forward. He was thinking there was gonna be a, perhaps a negotiation period or whatever here. And he wanted those POWs and those civilian attorneys out of Japanese hands as fast as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, another from our first questioner, Marsha Waldstreicher, she asks, were the, oh no, that's, does, do you believe that the Russian promise at the Yalta conference to invade Manchukuo precipitated the usage of the atomic weaponry? Um, and was Truman just flexing his political muscle by ending the war before the hated communists could finish the jobs the Americans had not? I think you kind of touched on this, but right. go ahead. Um, you know, um, obviously this has uh, been an important part of the controversy that somehow that the U.S. had ulterior motives besides simply ending the war as rapidly as possible and, and stopping the bloodletting as fast as possible. Uh, quite honestly, when you look at what Mr. Truman was looking at, I, th I think almost anyone... If you, if you put an array of who could have been president in 1945, from Franklin Roosevelt all the way through to Henry Wallace, uh, James Burns, whatever here, I think anyone looking at what Mr. Truman was looking at with respect to the Japanese weren't close to surrender, and then they're looking at this horrendous portrait of what Kyushu looks like for the invasion, I find it hard to believe that anyone who, who could have been president wouldn't have done the same thing Truman did. As one of my colleagues once phrased it, I think that at that point, the 
overwhelming priority was to end the war as swiftly as possible. And it would not have made any difference if there had been a Soviet Union or not a Soviet Union. The bombs would have been used at that point. Now, one of the historians I much admire who's worked this area very intensely, Barton Bernstein, has sort of described the, the, the degree to which they were aware that the bombs did have political implications with respect to the Soviets. But as uh, Dr. Bernstein phrased it one time, he says, that was sort of the bonus. They were going to do this regardless, but it would also have this additional effect that it might have a political impact. And you're dealing with uh, the Soviet Union's conduct in Europe at that point, which had become very problematic. Even Mr. Roosevelt in the last days of his life had recognized that there were going to be big troubles ahead in dealing with the Soviet Union. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Um, another question from Mark Kelso. Can you elaborate on the role of General Bonner Fellers in post-war Japan? Wow. <laughs> That's a question that goes a long way back and a long way forward or whatever here. Let me, let me see if I can do this as expeditiously as possible. The first, first starting point is this. The question about what to do with Emperor Hirohito had beset American policymakers in 44, 45. And they divided roughly into two camps. You could call one, you could call the retentionists. And these people generally tended to argue that we could use the emperor, especially to use the emperor to get the compliance of the Japanese armed forces with the surrender, that this was critical. Uh, and that basically he was sort of this figurehead or whatever. They were trying to minimize his role in the war. The abolitionists believed, however, on the contrary, and these tended to be the liberal progressive wing uh, of the advisors to Mr. Truman. They believed basically that in Japan, as it existed in 1945, a combination of the state religion, centralism, militarism, and the emperor system were all entwined. You couldn't separate them. And if we wanted a peaceful Japan, we were going to have to dismantle all three. And that included dealing with the emperor. Now, Bonner Fellers was an advisor to a subordinate of General Douglas MacArthur. And he and MacArthur had worked out what they called this wedge theory uh, that they were going to implement in Japan. And it sort of it fitted into this whole schema that was from Washington, which I should also add that Washington had issued an order to MacArthur right at the time of surrender that he was not to do anything with the emperor without authorization from Washington. And at no time did we promise Emperor Hirohito was going to be able to keep his seat on the throne. But when MacArthur gets into Japan, the theory uh, they call the wedge theory is that basically if we can use the emperor to uh, legitimize Japanese authorities acting on the U.S. behalf, carrying out U.S. policy aims, that this is going to be the best way to achieve an effective occupation of Japan and reformation of Japan. And this is, in fact, what eventually uh, comes, to, comes to pass. Uh, Washington will, in December 1945, will ask General MacArthur to finally provide an opinion on uh, Hirohito's, quote, war responsibility, unquote. And by that time, MacArthur is also facing the fact that this uh, urge to get all the boys home means that the occupation forces are being drawn down very dramatically. We're not going to have the bayonets to enforce occupation reforms without a, a compliance with the Japanese officials. And uh, MacArthur being MacArthur, of course, what he does is he lies. He says that... Uh, that basically he's investigated and Emperor Hito, he really had no big role in any of these things like Pearl Harbor or things like that, which of course is not true. But what is true is this, that uh, they've already realized that his role is going to be very important, not only in getting Japanese authorities to comply with American directives, but also there's a very serious issue that's lingering that we tend to forget about, which is, is there going to be an insurgency? And Japanese officers had made provisions for an insurgency in Japan. Uh, so you have that to worry about. And then you have Coming on top of that is this prospective famine where they believe that keeping the emperor around for stability to go through that crisis is going to be critical. So I think, you know, that's sort of a long way around. I, I think if we look at this, in my view, realistically, I think keeping the emperor on for about the first two years of the occupation was the sound policy to prevent an insurgency, to secure the compliance of the Japanese armed forces, and to get through the potential famine. Now, the big, big mistake was not then demanding that the emperor abdicate and take war responsibility. That was our big mistake in terms of dealing with Emperor Hirohito, in my view. And we didn't get a do-over with respect to Hirohito. Thank you. That was, that was a very thorough but um, condensed answer. So thank you for that. Um, uh, the next question is from Steve Vita. Um, he asks, was Japan close to making a dirty bomb per the History Channel shows? Uh, no, no. Uh, now, there's been various theories uh, about that. There was, you know, 
a really awful book that was published that claimed that they'd actually tested uh, an atomic bomb. Uh, there's no truth to that. Well, I would go back though, to the fact that the, the Japanese atomic bomb program was important, like I said, because basically it taught the leadership that you needed to produce visual material, which was tremendously difficult, which is why the Japanese were simply unfazed by that first bomb and the announcement that it was an atomic bomb. I mean, they knew, they understood that producing visual material uh, was so difficult. And that's why basically there's simply, there's no conceivable demonstration. Plus the fact that if you demonstrate it, then what, is, what if they move POWs and civilian internees into all their major cities? Then what do we do? Uh, and this was thought of by the scientists themselves. They pointed out that that was a real prospect if the Japanese had warning. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Colonel Cohn, who's one of the World War II veterans who's on, just made a comment which said, a wonderful and eye-opening presentation, particularly for us who served in Europe. So thanks for that, Colonel Cohn. <laughs> yeah. um, from Let Javier... Yeah, let me just touch briefly yeah. on one of the other elements. I mean, that there's, there's so much complexity in this and this in so little time here. But one of the things that was going on at this point was that uh, Germany had surrendered. And the plan to go forward at that point included, of course, finishing the war with Japan and a down, partial downsizing the armed forces. And this led to all kinds of problems, for, particularly for Mr. Truman, because this uh, whole issue of who was going to remain on active duty and go on to face Japan was critical, but more so because there was a widespread belief that after the war spending started, the economy was gonna go into a tailspin, at least go flat, if not recession. And the, and the soldiers and sailors and airmen who got home first would get the available jobs. So this was an extremely pointed issue with everyone who was in service or had some family member in service in 1945. We tend to overlook that whole thing. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for that perspective. Um, from Javier Abril, he asks, um, was there any plans at any stage to use atomic bombs at the tactical level to soften up the defenses of the landing beaches? That's an excellent question. And the answer to that is very much yes. So uh, basically what happens is that by the first days of August of 1945, the, the intelligence of the Japanese buildup on Kyushu is so overpowered uh, that General Marshall himself uh, has become extremely concerned. And there's an exchange he has with MacArthur, basically asking General MacArthur whether he still thinks Olympic is viable based on the intelligence. And General MacArthur, another one of his inimitable moments, says he doesn't believe the intelligence. Let's go ahead and do it. Well, uh, Marshall realizes, however, that, uh, that certainly Mr. Truman, who was not easily persuaded to authorize Olympic to begin with, is sure as heck not going to be real enthusiastic about Olympic now that they're looking at what they're looking at. And we have this transcript of a telephone conversation between one of General Marshall's uh, officers and a, a representative of the Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb uh, program. And that transcript is, is fascinating reading and also chilling reading. Because basically what the staff officer says is that General Marshall believes that either the Japanese government will surrender after the bombs have been dropped on two Japanese cities or no number of bombs dropped on Japanese cities will induce a Japanese surrender. And therefore, General Marshall is looking forward to take all the production of further atomic weapons and use them as we now call tactical weapons to support Olympic. I, you can see the reasoning behind this is clear that something dramatic is going to have to be done to keep Olympic viable in Marshall's viewpoint. And he's now looking at the question of tactical use of atomic weapons. And the chilling part of that uh, thing is that as to, in terms of safety, the only thing that comes up is not potential radiation exposure of U.S. personnel. It's what, it, what happens if you drop one of these and it doesn't go off? Then what do you, what do, you do? Uh, you know, walk softly around uh, the bomb that didn't go off? I mean, it's, it's a real uh, quandary. But that's the one safety issue that they recognize at that point, which shows you something about what they really understood about radiation. Definitely. Thank you. Um, a question from Jim Leggett. He asks, did war fatigue and economic pressures contribute to the decision to drop the bomb or a key factor or saving U.S. lives more? Uh, I, I think clearly it was much more in the forefront was this whole issue of saving lives, particularly with the Olympic looking awful. Uh, recently, there have been two really excellent books, uh, one called Implacable Foes, uh, by the late Walter Heinrichs and uh, Mark Galacchio, 
uh, and one that uh, Mark has just done called Unconditionals. And both of those really highlight to a much better degree than had ever been done before all the domestic problems that Truman was facing the summer of 1945. We've touched upon this partial drawdown and the partial demobilization and the issue that there was also this huge uh, press for a relaxation of the war economy to price more uh, consumer goods or whatever here. And Mr. Truman, as they show, was feeling tremendous pressure on that front also. Uh, and I, I don't think it, 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 it fundamentally shaped the decision, but it just added to the pressure that Truman felt he was under to bring the war to a close as soon as possible. And as uh, the great uh, mentor I had, uh, Barton Bernstein, once pointed out, that if at any point in the summer of 1945, Mr. Truman had truly believed the Japanese were about to quit, he would have immediately wheeled to start issuing directives about dealing with the economy and loosening it up and get the economy going because he understood that that was critical to not only the status of his presidency, but also the, the fate of his uh, party and various elections that were coming up. That's friendly. Thank you. Um, from Michael Rogers, he asks, in regards to the Pacific War, what did Truman get right and what did he get wrong? And then a follow-up, how do the people of Japan view MacArthur today? Well, um, I think, uh, and this recent book I was just mentioning, Unconditional, I think has a very shrewd assessment of Mr. Truman. Uh, and, you know, we, we have this image that came from later in Mr. Truman's career, you know, give him hell, Harry, sort of the, you know, underestimated guy who takes charge. Well, the reality was when Mr. Truman first takes charge, he is woefully unprepared for the job. And there's very poignant scenes of him not only diligently uh, going through the schedule he has to go through normally, but he takes on this enormous amount of paperwork every night. He's reading every piece of paper he can, as I pointed out, to try to figure out what Franklin Roosevelt's policies were on various issues. And he's reading all these intelligence reports, even much more diligent about that than Mr. Roosevelt was, in fact, at the end of, end of the time. So what you see is Mr. Truman, uh, much underrated, nonetheless feels his way through this. And I think he makes basically a series of sound decisions uh, for which he deserves the credit uh, some people give him and some people uh, don't give him. Now, the other part of the question was, was about uh, how MacArthur is viewed in Japan. That's an interesting uh, question because uh, the older Japanese who have some memory or family connections to the time of the, of the occupation uh, remember, and generally speaking, his status is pretty good. The younger generation of Japanese has been pointed out to me, have, they don't even remember the occupation at all, much less Douglas MacArthur. Um, so it, it's really, uh, you know, he's sort of a cipher to them. And there, there's a uh, actually a, a short biography I did of MacArthur's, that we're reprinting that in Japan and Japanese to sort of bring him back in, into at least their attention uh, with respect to what he did during the war and in the occupation. Great. Thank you. Um, and then this is the last set of questions that I see in the chat. So if anybody has any other questions, feel free to send them our way. But um, from Javier Abrel again, he asks first, um, is the book Hell to Pay accurate in its analysis of the situation as it appears to be very detailed? And then he also wants to know where you where he viewed the transcript of the phone conversation that you mentioned. Uh, uh, Health Pay does, I think, an excellent job of laying out all the issues about the mobilization, what has been referred to as a casualty issue, what, what was being contemplated in 1945 uh, to get ready for the final phase of the war and what was really going on with respect to projections of casualties. So, yeah, I can, I can highly recommend that. Uh, the transcript of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, phone conversation uh, is in the U.S. National Archives. Uh, if you have a copy of my book, Downfall, uh, I refer to it explicitly. I give you the exact citation of how you pull it up from the National Archives records, uh, the, the record group and the box number, whatever here. So yeah, it's, uh, but it's quite, uh, you may in fact be able to find it posted online now uh, if you just uh, try to find out uh, about this uh, conversation about the tactical use of nuclear weapons. Great, thank you. Um, We've been joined by another World War II veteran, J. Roy Roland, who says um, he comment, he wanted to comment on the second invasion after the initial invasion in the South. He was in the 13th Armored Division, which would have been in that invasion. Yeah, the 13th and the 20th were the two armored divisions that were being brought over for that operation. 
uh, yeah, uh, you know, any, anybody who uh, was involved in that, uh, looking at it, for, for very good reason, believed that, you know, their, their life, their well-being, very much hung upon getting the Japanese surrender as rapidly as possible. Uh, and especially for Olympic, I mean, I, I've described the situation if the operation had gone forward facing what it faced, these 10,000 Japanese aircraft half kamikazes, it would have been what I call kamikaze roulette. I mean, there's thousands of aircraft swooping down on the invasion beaches looking for a ship to crash as soon as possible. It's awful to think about. Certainly. Um, and welcome, Mr. Roland. We're glad that you could join us. Thanks for being here. Um, okay, one more question. Um, it says, uh, Max Hastings' book, The Secret War, seems to suggest that Intel played little value in World War II operations. It seems from your writing that may be true in the European theater, but not so true in the Pacific theater. Can you comment? <laughs> I'm a good friend of Max. <laughs> and I, I think we slightly part on this. I, I think Max is on to something. That there, there's a tendency to believe the intelligence was perfect and it's always guiding everything that goes on. Anybody who gets down into the weeds on this knows that this is not true. There are points, however, where the intelligence is critical and does guide things. And one of the things that's really spectacular in that respect, I think, are the intercepts of Japanese diplomatic and military communications in 1945. I mean, those were... Uh, and that Mr. Truman was clearly reading and taking in and uh, could see you know, what was going on. I can't, <laughs> I can't recommend enough re reading those uh, messages of uh, Ambassador Sato and the foreign minister. I mean, you talk, you talk about, you know, no holds barred, you know, you know, you don't understand the situation, almost like you idiots, you know, can't you see what reality is? And that's a level of comment that this otherwise dignified diplomat is making back to his own government in Tokyo. It's incredible. Amazing. The, the, the value and power of archival documents, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we, uh, we wrap up for the day? Uh, let me just close by saying this. It's not my position that uh, this is an issue about which we should not have further discussion or controversy. It's certainly not my position that when we count all the dead, we ignore the Japanese. In my book, Downfall, I was at great pain to provide very graphic, visceral descriptions of what the Tokyo fire rate of March 1945 and what it was like to be on the ground in Hiroshima when the bomb dropped. And what I'm working on now in this trilogy, in some respects, is spun out of that because I felt like I had failed with respect to fully vivifying this enormous number of non-combatant deaths who were not Japanese in the book. I could give you some numbers, but there simply was not archival stuff available then. It's available now, and that's what I'm trying to do in this trilogy, is to bring back to the attention of everyone who thinks about this, just how god-awful the war was, and exactly what the distribution of casualties, particularly non-combatant casualties, was between the Japanese and all others, which is a thing which is very much on the minds of Asians right to this very day. Certainly, certainly, definitely still an issue. So, well, thank you so much. And I think that's, uh, that's it for us today, but we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and share your expertise. Um, a lot of people in the comments have been saying they know a lot about the war, the war in Europe and not as much about the Pacific. So you've educated a whole host of new people. And um, right. yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity.